Well, I think we'll get things started. Good morning, everybody. I'm Julia Gerlach with No-Till Farmer, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar in which we'll be talking about how to establish soil microbial populations at planting to deliver crop nutrients throughout the season. This webinar is sponsored by Advancing Eco Agriculture, and we'd like to thank them for making it possible. And here to help us learn more about establishing soil biology at planting are David Miller and John Kempf. And I know at first it was gonna be John, then it was David, and now we get both of them. So we're very happy about that. Uh, John Kempf, of course, is the founder of Advancing Eco Ag and is a speaker, podcast host, and teacher who focuses on the potential of well-managed agriculture ecosystems to reverse ecological de degradation. And David Miller is the director of education at AEA, and he's also a regenerative consultant. Um, before we turn things over to John and David, just a couple of quick housekeeping items that we wanna make you aware of. Uh, we do encourage you to ask questions by clicking on the Q&A icon on your screen and no questions are too off the wall, so don't be shy. Um, John and David will be answering those questions throughout the presentation and also at the end. Uh, we are recording this webinar and we'll make a replay of it available to you on our website later this afternoon. Uh, so we will send you an email letting you know that it's available should you want to revisit the presentation. And then third, if for any reason the webinar is disrupted or you're seemingly disconnected from the broadcast, just go back to the invitation email you received and rejoin the webinar through the web link in that email. And with that said, thanks again for joining us. And now I'm going to turn the controls over to David Miller and John Kempf. Thanks for joining us, guys. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure to be with you and with your audience. Welcome, everyone, to this webinar. And like Julie said, it's going to be John and be David. Now it's going to be David and John, so you really get the bonus today. John had some um, things come up. He didn't think he was going to be able to make it, and last minute was able to make it after all. So we decided to. Um, do this webinar together. Having put the thought into it, I was ready to present, and so John's going to join us um, toward the end, and then we, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy as we learn, as we uh, share what we have learned, so we will Move forward from here. John, do you have a word to say in the beginning? I do. And uh, for all of you, uh, I know many of you have heard me present and heard my voice in the podcast. I'm really, I want to say thank you for being here and for coming to this event. Uh, David Miller has been, uh, he was the first agronomist that joined our team, if I recall correctly, back over a decade ago. He's extremely knowledgeable. And one thing I can promise you is unlike David invited you to, you will not be able to sit back and relax while David is presenting because he has a lot of information and uh, he's going to share, with, share it with you pretty quickly. So buckle your seat belts and hang on to your hats. Be prepared for a fun ride. This next hour is going to be very entertaining and lots of fun and very informative. All right. Thank you, John. Okay, let's roll. Here is a list of some of the things we're going to try and cover in the webinar. First, I want to talk about context. Then we'll look at how microbes biology gives you a better return on investment than fertilizer and how that works. We're going to look at why microbes are so critical to improve soil health and to build soil structure. We're going to share some insights and, and some experiences that we've had with growers who are on this regenerative journey. And then we'll give you a couple of tips on... Um, getting started with how to have the greatest effect in your plant health, soil structure, soil health by using biology. So context. <laughs> uh, isn't life all about context and everything we do is about where we are and what experiences we've had, what's the environment that we're in today and what does it look like for tomorrow? So I'd like to just Take a little bit of time, have you think about the brown material that you see when you dig up a plant, it's, you know, it's, it's brown or black or white, depending where you are. It's where you drive your tractor on, it's where you put your seeds in, it's where you spray your fertilizers or your insecticide, your herbicide, your fungicide, it's, it's either soil or dirt. It used to be soil, and some places it's now dirt. 
And some places it was dirt, it was soil, became dirt, and is going back to soil. And what's the difference between soil and dirt? And what is the context on your farm? So as you listen to this webinar, as you think about the biology, as you think about the things that you hear John and I talk about, think about the context of that information and how it's applicable to your operation. Is that brown material on your farm, is it soil or is it dirt? And what's the difference between soil and dirt? Let's also think about the context of the time that we're living in, the context of history, the context of our current situation with agriculture. And, and I put it here at this point as the era of antibiotics for the soil. You know, when we, when we have an illness, when we have a fever, when we have a virus, we have antibiotics to kill that, to destroy that. And we all know that when we take antibiotics, it's highly recommended for us to take probiotics again for optimum gut health. So think about the context of this conversation and how this fits within your operation as you think about your dirt or soil and the era that we live in, the time frame that we live in and what has happened to the microbial life in the soil. Let's think about the context of this conversation as tillage and carbon goes. Now, I, based on the, the title of this, the assumption could be that we're talking to primarily a no-till audience, and that may be true. So whether you till or don't till, think about what happens when the soil is disrupted, is flipped over, is, is turned, broken apart, and exposed to higher levels of oxygen than what it was designed and created to be exposed to. What happens to the carbon? You know, when I, when I was thinking about this, I had this thought that if carbon dioxide were a pitch black cloud, and we could see carbon dioxide running from there. If we could be carbon dioxide in the concentration of carbon dioxide, if you can imagine like morning and it's the difference between a bit of fog here and a bit of fog there and a light fog versus a really heavy fog the whole way that you're, you're driving. So think about tillage and acts of tillage on carbon. And then let's think about carbon in the context of fertilizer. What happens when you put on soluble nitrogen? We all know that the nature will have a, a nitrogen to ratio about 10 to 1. So what happens when we have lots more nitrogen? What happens with the carbon? Now let's think about carbon being oxidized by tillage and or by excessive nitrogen applications, and let's think about carbon and photosynthesis. When we have carbon, or we need carbon for photosynthesis, right? So if we have lost a lot of carbon, what happens to the photosynthetic process? Carbon is one of the primary building blocks needed for photosynthesis. So if we don't have carbon, our photosynthesis is limited. Y'all come with me on the context of where we are today, and I want you to think about your farm, and not just your farm in general, but think about a specific field. Think about your best field. Think about your worst field. Think about the differences in organic matter, in carbon, in soil structure, which is the next point. Photosynthesis, symbiosis, and soil structure. How does all of this play together, and what is the context of how well your plants are photosynthesizing, how well you have established a symbiotic relationship between the plant and the soil biology, and how is that affecting the structure in your soil? And how does that soil structure affect the water cycle? So when you have a drought, is the soil able to bring water through evapotranspiration up to the roots and your plants are able to go longer? When you have a downpour and you have lots of rain, are you able to infiltrate because you have soil structure? So all of these things are linked together, and it all comes to where are we in that trend? What is the context of this conversation, this story, as soil or dirt is concerned?
I'm going to just give you a couple seconds here to think about the brown material, the black material, or the white material, whatever color it is on your farm, that when you drive your tractor out there, where you put your seed, is it soil or is it dirt? What makes you say that? So, let's look at why are microbes so valuable? Why is in good of an investment. Why is why does it make so much sense? One of the reasons is because the yield potential on many grain crops and a lot of crops that you plant is established very early in the plant life. And also the establishment of that biology or the symbiotic relationship that is formed early in the plant life is going to determine the efficiency with which the plant is able to mineralize and gather nutrients, absorb nutrients from that soil profile. It's going to affect the carbon cycle. It's going to affect the soil structure. So why are microbes so valuable? Why, why is the investment in establishing good microbial in, inoculation and symbiosis early on so valuable and so powerful? One point is because the yield potential of many crops, especially grain crops, is established very early in the plant's life. The, the other is that the earlier you are able to establish that symbiotic relationship between the plant and the soil biology, the better nutrient absorption, nutrient mineralization you will have throughout the whole plant. So the image that you see on the left here is not just some random Photoshop image. This is an image from one of my growers that I got this spring. This is spring planted wheat in a very arid, sandy, desert soil. And this wheat has not germinated yet. So look at, look at that little plant, not even germinated yet, and look at all of that root biomass that's just coated with biology. That's what you call a very healthy rhizosphere. That, that zone is just loaded with lots of active biology that is going to mineralize and make nutrients available to that plant. Here's what, here's what, um, here's an example of what this means in dollars and cents. Now I don't have the exact dollars and cents because fertilizer prices are all over the board, but I'll let you do the math. If I can get my slides to move. Here we go. So this is a soil sample from a grower in Nebraska. I'd like to draw your attention to phosphorus. Now this is applicable for most all of these nutrients, but if you look at phosphorus, you can see that our P1 is at five and P2 is at 27. The highest is at 51 part per million per acre. If you look at the recommended fertilizer application, they're recommending to put out 100 pounds of P205, which would be 200 pounds of MAP. Which, you look at the, at the results, this grower needs phosphorus. Until you look at this analysis, which is a different extraction method. It's a very acidic extraction method that is going to extract all of the nutrients that you have in the soil. So we're looking at the top six inches and our roots should at least be going down double this amount. So you could technically double these numbers and if you look on the, on, on the right side of the screen here, you'll notice that we're talking about nutrients in pound per acre value in that first column. The next column is showing you the fertilizer equivalent in pounds of fertilizer. So look at this. We have 800 pounds per acre of phosphorus in the soil. So if you think in this top six inches, Extracting all of the phosphorus that's out there, there's 800 pounds per acre of phosphorus, which is the equivalent of 3,574 pounds of 11520. Now, if you're going to be applying 200 pounds of 11520, what does that cost? And how much does 200 pounds of 11520 increase the phosphorus number, not the P205 number, but the phosphorus number in your soil? You might be shocked when you do this math, but I'd encourage you to do it because it's quite astounding. And now when you look at 
successfully inoculating and establishing biology early on in the plant's life and you start to cycle this phosphorus instead of it being in the ground up rock form you are now mineralizing it and making it available to the plant and the plant has sufficient levels of phosphorus which you can validate by looking at a sap analysis look at the nitrogen if you remember back um, on on the previous slide it was showing that we wanted 250 units of nitrogen. How much nitrogen do we have here? What's, what's the missing link? Why would a plant not be able to get sufficient levels of nitrogen from this? And that's not even considering that 78% of the atmospheric gas that we breathe every day and that if our soil if it's soil, I should say, if it's not dirt but soil, is functioning as it should, then you should have that gas, that atmospheric gas with 78% nitrogen exchanging on a daily basis and extracting nitrogen from the atmosphere. Are you starting to see the value and how the return on investment of establishing biology very early on is so powerful? Here's another reason. Now this is an onion crop in the same soil of the wheat that I just showed you and this onion has not even fully emerged yet. And look at the root portion of it. It's amazing. It's coated. So when you think about uh, diseases that, that these onions have like pink root and you think about those what we call disease organisms which really are um, bacteria and fungi that have a very specific purpose and if they're out of control or outnumbered by beneficials, then they can be a problem. But when we have this level of beneficial bacteria, that's what I call protection. And so, as John says, healthy plants can be 100% resistant to all insects and diseases with regenerative agriculture. What John is saying here is that when we have a healthy plant and a healthy soil system, when we have a, a healthy plant that's not just propped up by some soluble fertilizer and pesticides in dirt, but we actually have a soil system, plants are able to actually build resistance. And we're going to look at that just briefly. We can't go into the details because each of these points could in fact be a whole webinar on their own. So I want to give you the whole picture and I want you to keep, re keep remembering and thinking about the context in which we're talking about these, about all of these points. So let's look at soil health. And when we look at soil health, you may wonder why do you look at photosynthesis? What about soil is photosynthetic? <clears throat> Never heard that, uh, you know, increased organic matter enhances photosynthesis in the soil. No, photosynthesis always comes with plants. And this is why it's so valuable and why so many people fortunately are going to are, are, are practicing and, and are applying a lot more attention to cover cropping and to not excessively tilling the soil because we know that when we have a diverse growing crop whatever that is then we have photosynthesis and why is that so important because when we have full capacity photosynthesis Let's just talk about photosynthesis for a second here and make sure we understand what photosynthesis is. The sun shines leaf. The leaf has developed and formed chlorophyll, or chlorophyll, and, and in that chlorophyll or the chloroplast, um, a reaction happens when the energy of the sun hits that leaf. The photonic energy will convert the water, H2O, and carbon dioxide, CO2, which Hopefully you have enough in the soil after all the tillage, after all the fertilizer, and after all the carbon dioxide that we've released. Hopefully there's enough carbon dioxide for the crop to photosynthesize. If you take away any of these components, if you take away the sunshine, guess what? There's no photonic energy to make that reaction happen. If you take away the water, guess what? There's no H2O and you're not able to make that happen. If you take away the CO2, which either comes from 
And, and the way you would limit the CO2 is not having enough organic matter, not having enough biology, or your biology not being active enough because there's not enough sugars coming through photosynthesis. So you see, it's a, it's a circular thing. It's, it's the exciting. It's really exciting because anything that's circular, if you hack into that circle and you trigger it, it will expand and it becomes greater and greater and greater. Or if the cascade goes the other way, it'll become worse and worse and worse and worse. So let's be careful how we're spinning that circle. If you take away the minerals, manganese, iron, nitrogen, phosphorus, magnesium are kind of the core five that we look at. There's, they're among many others that are important for photosynthesis. But if you take away any of these, your capacity of photosynthesis or the volume of sugars that you're going to be producing to push out through the roots and to build and grow the plant and your crop that you're getting paid for, it's going to be less. So the less photosynthesis, the less sugars to the roots. The more photosynthesis, the more sugars to the roots. And if, this is a big if, if we have soil biology established on those roots, we will accelerate the bacterial digestion and the mineralization of what's happening in the soil. So that means the more efficient the photosynthesis is, the more sugars we will produce and the more nutrients will be available to the plant in a microbial metabolite form, which is very important because if we don't have the nutrition available in a microbial metabolite form, meaning like microbe manure or dead microbial bodies, and the plant's just taking it up in simple ion form, it will take eight to 12 times more energy for the plant to convert a simple ion than it will for it to use a microbial metabolite and synthesize it into plant material into proteins, etc. So what that means is when we have a plant that's absorbing the majority of its nutrients in the form of microbial metabolites, we are now able to use that extra energy to build more lipids, more plant secondary metabolites, more of the complex carbon molecules that only healthy plants are able to produce because we have the biology working for us. We have the biology pre-fabricating um, those minerals and those compounds. In, in fact, um, James White talks about the rhizophagy cycle and he talks about the plant actually absorbing the bacteria. And so there's so much in this whole biological symbiosis that's so much as I could, <laughs> In fact, some days I want to be a little microbe and go down there and just check it out. So when we have increased levels of plant secondary metabolites, we have increased levels of lipids, that means we now have more fungal digestion. What this means is that the plant has higher levels of plant secondary metabolites. Let's say we triple the amount of aromatic compounds, and which is the plant secondary metabolites, that the plant is producing. That means more of those will be pushed out through the roots. Now, Fats cannot be digested by bacteria, so those are digested by fungi, if we have fungi. And when we have fungal digestion of these plant secondary metabolites, now we're really building soil structure. And I think this is why many people have looked back and have said, wait, I've been doing this for 10 years and I still have compacted soil. I still struggle with this, that, or the other. You know, I'm I'm not getting the soil structure that I want. I'm not getting the water penetration and infiltration that I'd like to see. And I think this is a key part right here. If you're still using soluble fertilizers, and I should maybe um, quantify that or, or put some brackets around there, if you're applying excess amounts of soluble fertilizer, there needs to be a transition. There needs to be a time of building this. And then that's where consultants and having a peer group are so important in this regenerative um, process of transitioning. Because if you just completely take off synthetic fertilizers, you could have a withdrawal effect that doesn't look pretty. So think about the context of where you are. Think about your transition. Look at where you are and think about are you absorbing most of your micro, most of your nutrition in the form of microbial metabolites so that you have enough energy to feed the fungi. 
and really built humus in your soil. This is just a bit of an approach, just something to give you some, some steps to take home. We have put together these programs to just kind of help formalize a transition process and what a successful season looks. Make sure you have biology in the beginning. The Regen Soil Primer, we'll talk about that in a second. The BioCode Gold, again, a biological inoculant. We talk about Nitrogen Efficiency Program, which is a program that John developed to help maximize the efficiency of the nitrogen, but also reduce the negative impacts that it has on biology. Using plant sap analysis to verify that we have all of the building blocks, all of the nutrients that we need to maximize photosynthesis. And then changing that based on the sap, based on the sap analysis, we can change those deficiencies or excesses with our foliar applications. And then we follow up the season with, with um, a biological inoculation, depending on what the crop, what the next crop, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all, again, context dependent. Where are you today? Where is your operation today? What are you looking at? So the regenerative soil primer is made up of Rejuvenate, Sea Shield, and Spectrum. Spectrum is the actual microbial inoculant. Rejuvenate and Sea Shield are what I call the support package. They're the tools, they're the, they're the energy, they're the food. It's kind of like if you wanted to inhabit an island where nobody has ever been. There's no tools, there's no infrastructure, there's no economy, there's nothing. And if you just drop a bunch of people off, it'll probably be really, really rough getting things started. If you drop them off with just a very simple food source, just a fat food like burgers and fries and soda pops, they're probably gonna sit around and get lazy and not do very well in getting themselves established. If you drop them off with some tools, with some good stable food like rice and beans with a little bit of shelter, you can probably have a lot better establishment rate and the economy is going to prosper and, and grow a lot faster because they have enough energy, they have a, a little bit of tools to get started, but they can't live on that forever. They have to get up and move and do things. And that's the same with the biology. And that's what Rejuvenate and Sea Shield are used for and that's why they're so important with the spectrum or whichever microbial inoculant that you're using is they are that support package for the establishment period. At some point your crop residue and or your plants need to have that symbiotic relationship with the biology in order for it to continue growing, reproducing and changing your soil. I want to point out here that there's there's thought about changing the soil balance and if you reflect back to the soil samples that we looked at and you look at the total amount of minerals that's out there uh, it really begs the question of of what is the benefit of putting out a thousand pounds of rock phosphate or a ton of lime or 500 pounds of the gypsum like there are times there are places it's it, there's always somewhere that it makes sense to do that but think about the context and think about do you have a well-functioning soil or do you have mostly dirt? How much biology do you have? If you look at your soil sample and you see, I need more phosphorus, I'm going to correct this phosphorus. How much phosphorus do you need to put out to correct the phosphorus deficiency if you already have 811 pounds out there? If you don't have biology, you're just putting out more ground up rock and it's not going to affect your crop performance. If you put out a foliar application, but you don't have that healthy root symbiotic relationship, if, if that rhizosphere isn't well connected and well covered with biology, then it's also a dead end street because you enhance the photosynthesis with your foliar application, but then it just increases the sugar content. The plant sends out signals for more energy. Let's go, but there's nobody there. So that's also a dead end street. And that's why establishing that functioning microbial plant symbiotic relationship is just the key to success. It just is. Any way you cut the pie, any way you slice and dice it, whatever perspective you're looking from, all of the pieces are important, right? I don't want to say that this is more important than that. I don't want to say that, you know, if only you had minerals or if only you have biology, you really need the whole system. But without biology, it'll be a long road. You won't make it, actually.
All right, let's talk about BioCode Gold. BioCode Gold is a treat seedment. So, a treat seedment, wow, how's that? A seed treatment, if, if you are putting biology like the Rejuvenate Sea Shield Spectrum as a soil primer, that can be applied broadcast, depending what crops you're, you're growing, that's ideal to incorporate it um, lightly and broadcast it. At other times, it makes sense to put it right in furrow. But whatever you do, the BioCode Gold brings in the mycorrhizae component or the fungal component. The spectrum does not have the mycorrhizae, does not have the fungal component. So putting that right on the seed is key. And it's been astounding the success that we've had with the BioCode Gold. There's really not anything that you could do that has as consistently brought results for the dollars invested like BioCode Gold. It's just the return on investment is phenomenal. Again and again and again. I wanted to touch on on-farm versus off-farm biology or bringing biology in using spectrum or using your own compost tea. And I think it's amazing when a grower is able to build his own compost and, and brew a compost tea and use it consistently. But in the last decade that I've been working with growers, I've worked with many growers that were doing that. And when they learned about Spectrum, when they learned about the Tinyo product lineup, there's very few that still built their own compost tea. And here's why. It's very challenging to have a consistent product. You really have to like, <laughs> you really have to enjoy brewing tea, kind of like brewing coffee. If you don't like coffee, you probably eh, don't really want to spend the time brewing it. It's kind of an art, even more so than a coffee. But if you don't have consistent um, everything, consistent raw ingredients, consistent processes, consistent handling, then your results are going to be very variable. There's things to consider about your like herbicide residues. I've had people who used a compost tea that came from, um, from um, like city yard waste and there was herbicides and they put it on their tomatoes and it was not good. So just think about the context. It's great. It's amazing. If you're able to do it, if it fits your farm, if it fits your context, more power to you. But what, what we have found over the last 10 years of consulting with growers is that most of the time, if you have a large operation, if you're a commercial operation, it's a real challenge to have enough labor that is, that is, what's the right word, intuitive and artful enough to actually make the compost tea. And so often what happens is the compost tea comes back to the grower, to the owner himself, to the manager, and they're busy with everything else. So we have found very consistent results. We have, we are very happy with what we are seeing with using Spectrum, Rejuvenate, Sea Shield, and, and that combination and what changes we have seen in the soil. The nitrogen efficiency program is, is simply a stabilization and a balance of additional nutrients like molybdenum and sulfur to help make the nitrogen that you apply less leachable, less soluble, and more, um, it, it's going to be more likely that the plant takes it up in, when it needs it and in a microbial form. So it helps convert the nitrogen from a soluble nitrogen form to a complete protein form. So with that, John, I'm going to turn it over to you. You're still with me. Oh, David, I'm taking a vacation. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the pieces that David has been talking about, There's there's been a number of questions that have come through, and uh, we're looking forward to getting into those in the Q&A. But I think fundamentally, um, if the, the, the foundational point of view 
that David is describing is that it is possible for plants to get their nutrition in the form of microbial metabolites, in other words, from living biology. And it's possible for this to happen in agricultural ecosystems. It's possible for biology to supply 100% of a plant's nutritional requirements without any added fertilizers, including nitrogen. And this is the important piece. It's, uh, there's getting to be fairly widespread recognition that we can, we can release and solubilize phosphorus and potassium from the soil profile um, that is in the locked up soil reserves and make it available to plants. There's uh, many growers who have experienced that and observed that, but there are still question marks and reservations around nitrogen. And uh, our experience has been that, uh, in fact, you can do the same thing with nitrogen, that you can provide 100% of a crop's nutritional requirements with nitrogen. And uh, the interesting part is that we have many organically certified growers that we're working with, um, even a few who are in very arid environments who are not using cover crops. And we are experiencing nitrogen excesses on their crops rather than nitrogen deficiencies. And that's 100% coming from biology. It's not coming from manure. It's not coming from compost. In some cases, there's even no contribution by cover crops. It's exclusively biology. So um, there's a few examples that we want to talk about. And, and uh, David, you actually worked with James on his operation. Can you tell us a little bit about what he experienced there and what the context is for the yield responses that he observed? Yeah, so um, again, biology was an important part of this, but then also context really helped us understand the cotton production and how um, excessive nitrogen, especially soluble nitrogen, and may I say at the wrong time, um, caused a lot of bowl drop. And so there was this vegetative growth and then growth regulator and then nitrogen and vegetative growth and growth regulator, just really this, this kind of on, off, on, off. And it it, there was a lot of bowl loss and it also created a lot of stress for the plant because the growth regulators in fact shut down the plant where it's not photosynthesizing. So it was just a combination of looking at all of the context and obviously it started with um, soil biology. James is using cover crops um, where he can and when it fits, but a very He's very detailed about making sure he has good biological establishment when he when he starts these plants, and then we do a sap analysis, and he and he um, adjusts his fertigation and foliars accordingly. And uh, there's a question uh, on the yield response, David. There's a question that came up in chat: Are these yield responses from replicated strip trials, or are they only a certain spot in the field? In other words, did we hand pick locations to try to make the yield response look good? <laughs> we wouldn't ever do that. No, these this was his his farm average, whole farm average. This was his whole farm average. Yes. So, yep. um, and that included about two hundred acres of of spots that still had Texas root rot. So, <laughs> those spots are getting a lot smaller, and that well, that in and of itself is going to increase the yield. Yep. So here's an operation um, that we've had the fun of working with Dan in, in his operation um, in North in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, again, Dan has worked with biology and used the soil primer uh, on his soil. And his last comment here, AEA products helped open up our soil. This is something uh, that we keep hearing over and over again from growers who use the soil primer, is that all of a sudden, if they are still tilling their soils, their soils till a lot easier, and they have much better water infiltration, and they have much less compaction. And it's a lot of fun to observe that happening. So this is actually an aerial view of a cotton crop, uh, treated and untreated, the exact same variety, the same day. All the treatments were exactly identical. No management differences, except one uh, had the soil primer treatment and the next did not. And to go back to the question that uh, the most the recent question that we answered about uh, replicated field trials um, versus individual spots, um, we do some field trials uh, and some third party field trials scattered around the country, but um, we have enough of a track record of success 
um, over the last decade and a strong enough reputation that generally when we start working with farmers, we will do entire fields um, or even entire farms. And we get these types of crop responses. So it's, uh, it's fairly significant. And when you, can, when you can do that on an entire large scale environment, then uh, obviously you're not uh, spot picking any results. I really enjoy this photo. This is again uh, wheat that was, this was with soil primer applied in the fall um, before wheat planting, or we could even say late summer. And uh, we have the exact same juice bottle in both, uh, both fields, one with the treatment, one without. Again, all other conditions being identical, and we get a radically different crop response. And this is an expression. Uh, you know, Dr. James White, I asked him the question, how much of a plant's total nutritional requirements can soil biology deliver? And his response was, well, we don't know because no one's actually looked, but in non-domesticated ecosystems, uh, wild plants, weeds, and so forth, um, early quick looks indicate that it can be greater than 95%, perhaps even 100%. And it seems reasonable to expect that many of our domesticated crops have the exact same capacity. So this is what David, the point that David was making is that uh, we want biology to, or we want plants to absorb nutrition in the form of biological uh, metabolites. In other words, microbe poop uh, or parts of bacterial cells. And when that happens, we develop these types of plant structures and also these types of root structures. So not only is this root structure that has the primer applied to it, um, not only does it have really good aggregation, really good porosity, pore structure, gas exchange, and all those positive attributes, but uh, in addition to that, uh, this is also a soil that uh, we have such vigorous biology that it can access water in very dry soil conditions because fungi in particular can access water that plant roots can't access, and this crop is going to have a lot of lot more drought resilience, not because of the greater root system, but, but because of the greater fungal colonization. Back to you, David. All right, so that's um, a lot to think about, right? And you don't have to feel like you're on your own. There are increasing numbers of of commercial food producers who are doing this. It's not just some idea that's John, that, that John is fantasizing about. This is, this is practical. So you have a peer group that, that is available. Tap into it. And here at AEA, we have a team. There's a whole team of people that is, this photo isn't quite up to date. There's quite a number more. You can call the 800 number and there's somebody there that will be able to help you. And we work together. Uh, one of the things that's very unique about our company is it's um, very non-territorial. So we have people who are very experienced in certain crops. We have people who are very experienced with certain soil types. Um, there's there all kinds of different personality types on our team. So. Maybe you just don't like working with me. Well, there's another guy that some you know that you'll like working with. Um, so we have a team that's able to that's able to help you, and we have the experience of working with farms across the country and crops of all sorts. And if we haven't worked with it yet, we believe that plants are plants. If a plant photosynthesizes, and if a plant has roots in the soil, then many, if not all, of the principles apply. And if you apply the principles, it works. So, what are the questions? John, if you want to lead out with the questions. Yeah, we've got quite a few questions here in the Q&A. Thanks, you. I really enjoy this part of the conversations and the participation, so I welcome your input. If you have any questions, type them into the Q&A box. Um, we have... A couple dozen so far, and um, I'm sure we'll have many more coming in. So David and I are going to go through these and uh, respond to them as well as we are able, as, and as many as we are able. Uh, first question from Geo. Uh, we know that soils are rarely phosphorus and potassium deficient. 
it's a matter of solubilizing them using microbes. But for nitrogen, can we replace mineral fertilization with microbial fertilization? In other words, can these N2 fixing bacteria supply the needs of even heavy, heavy feeding crops? David? Um, the answer is yes, if there's, there's a lot of things to consider. Um, and and there's a transition. There's you can't take a dead soil that doesn't have a functioning soil system, or as I've had growers tell me, thin soil. You can't have thin soil. So I was on a I was on a a farm in the southwest, and he this grower took me to a neighbor's field, and they bury their drip tape about eight inches deep, ten inches deep, depending where you are. Well, this field had most of the drip tape exposed on the upper end of the field because they had just gotten four inches of rain. The solution Ouch. to that was to just bury the drip tape a little bit more. Okay. What are you, what, it goes to the context again. Are you farming dirt or are you farming soil? How much of the soil has left your operation? And so the answer is yes, but you need to consider the context and you need to look at do I have enough carbon do I have enough gas exchange what is the limiting factor what would keep the biology from feeding this crop because if you don't feed the biology and if you don't have the biology then you won't be able to keep up with the nitrogen demands so it really needs to there, there needs to be a conversation about where are you today how much nitrogen are you currently using what's your crop being dependent on or what rather what's What's the soil depending on you to supply? And then how are you going to transition from that amount to the crop, the, the soil supplying everything? Thank you, David. Uh, <clears throat> there's another question here um, from Mr. Anonymous, or perhaps Mrs. Anonymous. Can you please go over the carbon limitation in soil in the context of photosynthesis once more? And uh, this is something I'm happy to respond to. I've, we've actually talked about this in some of our webinars where we talk about uh, increasing photosynthesis and increasing genetic potential. And um, the, the bottom line, quite simply, is that uh, for most outdoor agriculture environments, when you have a green photosynthesizing plants in the vegetative or in the grain fill stages, uh, it's common for those fields of crops to deplete the carbon dioxide levels in the local atmosphere down to under 100 parts per million by 9 or 10 a.m. in the morning. And when that happens, for the rest of the day, even though you may have perfect conditions in terms of temperature and lighting and water supply and so forth, the limiting factor for photosynthesis for the remainder of the day is carbon dioxide supply. And in fact, what we've observed is that carbon dioxide is one of the biggest limiting factors uh, for photosynthesis and for yield potential. It's, it's as significant as water. So we all know the huge impact that water supply has on yields and, and plant productivity. Carbon dioxide has as significant an impact as water does, but because we don't see it, we often don't pay attention to it. And it is the function of microbial respiration in the soil to release carbon dioxide uh, and gas it and volatilize it into the atm atmosphere so that plant leaves can absorb it. And so we actually, as farmers, um, we don't want to sequester large amounts of carbon in our soil. We want to cycle large volumes of carbon through our soil. So we want the carbon to go into the soil and then be released back into the atmosphere while we have green growing plants capable of capturing it and then also capturing additional from the atmosphere. So it's not a question of storage, it's a question of cycling. And um, this is a much bigger, has a much bigger impact on yield potential and photosynthesis than is commonly realized. Um, it's, you know, when we have this conversation about uh, yield limiting factors and, and uh, Liebig's law of the minimum, the barrel with the broken off staves that all of us have seen 50 times or more, I have yet to see a barrel that includes water and carbon dioxide and yet as we know those are some of the biggest limiting factors um, 
Question from Alex. Can we spray soil primer ahead of planting as we are not set up for liquid fertilizer on our planter? Will it be as efficient? And the answer is yes, it's a common practice and we do it all the time. Question from Ryan for you, David. Uh, can you use BioCoat Gold as a replacement for weed talc in corn and beans? Yes, commonly the recommendation is to just whatever amount of BioCoat Gold you're applying just reduce that amount of the talc. Okay, awesome. Um, another question, what situations have you come across with your clients that your methods have fallen short and what have you learned from them? Those are always the fun ones. Um, David, you want to speak a little bit about uh, the the one chili pepper operation in, uh, I think it was in Arizona, where we're having challenges getting microbial responses because of low carbon? So, so this maybe my perspective is, is a bit different on this, but that our methods have fallen short. I would like to say that the only places that our methods have fallen short is if we have misidentified the greatest limiting factor or if we've not been able to supply that limiting factor like you suggested john um in in the chili pepper crop that uh, we've been looking at building soil <clears throat> um and and growing this you know putting this method together the grower will say well you know why are we not seeing this and this is an organic crop and it's hot, it's dry, there's a lot of tillage because it's organic. And so it feels like, and, and I've gotten some feedback from some people like, well, it's working there. But the reality is, it's working, it will always work. It's about what are the missing pieces, right? So I feel like the regenerative model, when we follow the design of nature, when we emulate those things, it will work. So we have learned so much in the last 10 years that, yeah, you don't even want to ask the question. And it has brought us to the place where we know so little. We really don't know anything. We still have a lot to learn. And if you you as a grower are looking for somebody who has it all figured out and who have all the products that everything just works every time, then you probably should dial another 800 number because that's not us. We're looking for people to partner with. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of success, hundreds of people who are just delighted with, with what they have seen, but we are learning. And we will keep well, I think the, the essence of your response, David, is that uh, the principles always work. And uh, once if you, if you work from a place of first principles and foundational principles, they are always effective. And when they seem to not work, it's because we have missed some of the information in the context and uh, there, there's something that's missing. So, right. Yeah. Um, there's another question here. Um, can you elaborate on compost tea benefits versus simply applying high quality compost? And uh, from a question from Greg, I would say that uh, in general, I'm a big fan of applying high quality compost uh, or even high quality compost tea. Uh, the question is mostly a question of supply. Uh, at, at the scale that we work and the number of farmers that we work with, we simply a supply of high quality compost doesn't exist to cover the amount of acres that need to be covered. And uh, so that's been a foundational challenge for us. Um, if, you, if you do have high quality compost, you will be bringing in a carbon component that you won't be getting with just a compost tea. So from that aspect, if you have the resource on in, in your region or for your operation, then there could be advantage there. A compost tea, you might be able to get higher numbers of bacteria or fungi, especially bacteria, by brewing a tea 
because you're growing the biology and the solution. Yep. Um, there's a question on uh, our thoughts on Dr. Ingham's work. What are your thoughts on Dr. Ingham's work on the soil food web and the need to have multiple trophic levels represented in biological products? Do your products have all these trophic levels, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, etc.? Um, so the answer is that our materials, uh, the products that we use, generally focus primarily on bacteria and fungi, uh, less so on protozoa, nematodes, and so forth, although in specific situations and specific contexts, we make recommendations for those materials as well. Um, fundamentally, though, I think our, our foundational perspective is that um, we, we need to, in many cases, we need to reestablish some of what has gotten missing in many of these soils, and we have lots of evidence to suggest that that is the case. But then the most powerful way to really change biology and to establish all these trophic levels in a significant way is to use plants to do that. Um, and not all plants will have the same... Uh, we, we know that different types of species, take buckwheat or oats versus corn or soybeans, for example, they will have completely different symbiotic microbial populations of the root system. And so this is one of the reasons for having more diversity of plants in a soil is because we also diversify and stabilize the soil microbial population. However, um, Oat plant, if you, even within a single species, whether that's corn or soybeans or rice or wheat, whatever it might be, even within a single species, the microbial population that has a symbiotic relationship with that plant will not be the same at different or will not be in the same proportions at different levels of plant health. So when you have plants that are photosynthesizing fairly poorly, the microbial population will be different then if you have abundant photosynthesis and are producing lots of lipids and sending lipids into the root system. So um, there is, I would suggest to a large degree, it is plants that have a significant influence on changing soil biology, uh, probably bigger or in addition to the microbial inoculants that we are adding. David, is there anything you'd like to chime in on that? No, I think that's good. It's the the question is how how long have you been using antibiotics in your soil? Like, are there strains, species, types of bacteria, fungi, protozoa that are gone? Yep. And um, how much time do you have to restore it as well? If you have a lot of time, you can do multiple species cover crops. You have a couple years for that to rejuvenate. A decade for it to rejuvenate, um, then you know that plays into your into your plan of action as well. Yep, David. Here's a question for you from Martin: Can the soil be applied through irrigation in a center pivot? Yes, very effectively. Yep. Only the only um, caution I would put out is don't apply it on top of dry soil with a quarter inch of of irrigation water, you know, if you have three, four inches of, of dry soil, and then you put it out, put it out, you know, on a, on a cool rainy day, or maybe not a rainy day, but when you have cool cloudy weather. Um, so think about, again, context and, and what's going to be most conducive for the microbes to, to um, be established. Yep. Here's a question, how much nitrogen, how much reduction of nitrogen should we recommend with the use of BioCoat Gold and Soil Primer? And the answer is very simple. You should not guess. You shouldn't guess about any of these things. And this is one of the foundational reasons for our success in our work at Advancing Ecoagriculture is you should never guess about something that is possible to measure and something that's as, that is as important as nitrogen. So this is where we rely on the use of plant sap analysis. You can also um, use soil analysis, the Haney analysis to some degree to evaluate your soil's uh, capacity to deliver nitrogen. But um, you should measure what the crop's requirements are and apply what is needed and no more. And um, what that means in practical terms in our experience is that often when we uh, look at uh, using the soil primer, we're using a BioCoat Gold, we're using our nitrogen efficiency program. 
Um, there's variation from operation to operation, of course, but usually we're somewhere in the neighborhood of reducing nitrogen between 30 and 50% in the first year. Um, sometimes more than that, sometimes less. It depends on how efficient growers are being already when we begin. Anything you'd like to add to that, David? No. Um, Yeah, question from Paul, how do you determine your application rate it's based on what tests? For instance, in Nebraska, we have a half a percentage organic matter tilled sandy soils and 5% long-term no-till soot loam soils with everything in between and more. Um, if you have lots of in-field variation um, and you're not able to measure that variation, then obviously uh, that means you have to manage that field according to the lowest common denominator. You have to measure it to the soil that has least capable of delivering nutrients. Uh, but the answer to your first question, how do you determine your application rates? We always determine our application rates based on laboratory data of uh, preferably SAP analysis because we know and understand its accuracy and reliability. Um, and sometimes where appropriate, we also use Haney analysis, uh, particularly for nitrogen recommendations. There's a question here from uh, Corey. Um, have you experienced adding your primers along with raw minerals such as volcanic rock dust? Would a would this be a little probiotics with the prebiotics? Um, Corey, we have some experience with this, limited experience, mostly on um, higher value crops such as uh, fruit and vegetable crops, less so on broad acre crops. And the answer is yes, it can be very effective. Um, in general, yeah, I should be hesitant, but uh, I'm, and in general, I see that um, soil amendments of rock powders produce a soil response, but they often fail to produce a crop response or a crop health response in particular. So um, I, if they're inexpensive, there's something worth looking at, but they would not be the first or the second or even the third item that I would look at in terms of priority of delivering a strong economic response with my present understanding. Um, next question here is uh, from Alejandro. Do you recommend the use of salt primer in the fall? How do you recommend it in tropical agriculture where we have vegetables such as tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, etc. in the winter? Uh, the original intention of the soil primer was to be used in the fall as a residue digester. That was the original reason and purpose for which we intended its use and it was so effective and delivered such great soil microbial responses that now it's being widely used in fall applications, in spring applications, and in, in furrow applications, and sometimes even in season as a side dress. Um, so it's become our single most popular product for the very simple reason that it delivers economic results over and over again when growers use it. Um, so the answer is yes, you can use it in the fall and you can use it almost at any point in the growing season and expect to observe a soil and crop response. Um, question from Steve Mesner, how do you find out what your soil biology is? Um, there's obviously different ways of answering this question by using microscopes and, and uh, different types of assays. The type of assay that I've observed that I'm the most intrigued by, and uh, we still need to get experience with it. I don't have a lot of experience at this point, but I'm really intrigued by the possibilities uh, described by a company called Biome Makers. So they have uh, a DNA profiling, uh, a genetic sequencing test that they can run that is uh, is, in my understanding, um, competitively priced and can give us some very valuable information. So I would highly recommend that as a first place to look. Um, question from Mike, what is your experience with sandy granitic soils with low CEC? We have lots of experience with sandy soils uh, in all parts of the country from Michigan to Florida to California and in between. Um, I don't know how many of them are based on granite, but again, uh, the answer comes back to if you, if you focus on the foundational principles and you use lab testing, you use soil testing and sap testing to determine what's actually going on, 
then these principles can be applied successfully in, in any soil context or in any environmental context. Um, there's a question here from Andre. Um, soil test results give a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 10 as an optimal value. How important is this in your reasoning? Um, important for what becomes the follow-up question. Um, there is, uh, I'm going to take a, a broader view of, of this question for just a moment. The, there is a growing interest in balancing uh, ratios in the soil, such as fungal biomass to bacterial biomass and carbon to nitrogen ratios and so forth. Um, justifiably, necessarily, these are, these, it's very important to understand and manage these ratios only once we have crossed a threshold of some minimal levels, some minimal boundaries. So, for example, a, a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 10 to 1 is important once we have a total level of, I'm just going to make up some hypothetical numbers here, once we have a total level of 10,000 pounds of carbon per acre and, and 1,000 pounds of nitrogen. But if you have 50 pounds of total nitrogen in the soil profile and 500 pounds of total carbon, the carbon to nitrogen ratio is to some degree irrelevant because the total levels are so small that the ratio doesn't even really matter. Um, and the same holds true of fungal to bacterial biomass ratios, where um, there are some who want to really focus on the ratios and say that, well, we have really bacterially dominated soils. We don't have anywhere near enough fungal populations. We need to build our fungal biomass. That only becomes something worth caring about and worth paying attention to once the levels of bacteria and fungi are significantly higher than they are at the baseline. So um, it's, uh, the ratios are not unimportant, but they are of secondary importance to actually building the levels of nutrition and biology in our soil profile in the first place. Um, Question from Jim, if you were to use one product to start with, would the seed coat be the best bang for the buck? And the answer is yes. Uh, we actually look at, um, and, and we are constantly doing ROI analysis on what are the types of applications that produce the biggest economic responses for growers. Seed treatments are definitely the easy win. Uh, in the number two spot uh, are often foliar applications that are specifically designed based on sap analysis. And then in the number three spot is the soil primer and uh, inferro seed treatments. Um, question from Jose, have you had experience with soils in the crops in the tropics and would our products have the same efficacy as in, as in the US? And the answer is yes, we have done some work particularly in Mexico and other tropical environments as well in the past. Um, then there's a question from Gary, uh, the, or a comment. The carbon storage story in the soil is not the one that carbon dioxide removal folks want to hear. Uh, that's interesting the way you framed that, Gary. I actually thought uh, you were asking the reverse question of, of what you asked. Um, so I'm trying to think of ways to describe this simply, but uh, I, I mentioned the carbon cycle a little bit ago that really we want to, the, the healthiest farms, or let me say it this way, the highest yielding soils, the highest yielding soils are the soils that cycle the largest volume of carbon. Not that store the largest volume of carbon, but that cycle the largest volume of carbon. And um, the, the pathway for us as regenerative producers to regenerate soil health while we are growing a crop is to have that cycle always be slightly net positive that we that we gain slightly more in our soil than we lose uh, and how much do we gain in each growing season maybe it's five percent or ten percent of the total carbon volume that is cycled and that those gains can can uh, add up quite significantly but the gain or the loss is dependent on management, is dependent on the crop's photosynthetic efficiency and their success at capturing the carbon dioxide that is released from the soil profile. 
And that is also, of course, dependent on when carbon dioxide is released from the soil profile. If we have crop residue in the fall, that's largely gone by spring. If we add nitrogen to a crop residue in the fall, then that crop residue is going to r release and, and uh, dissolve as carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And we don't have a crop there to capture it unless we're growing cover crops. And so uh, as a result, we lose most of that carbon into the system. So anyway, the, the point is simply that, uh, yes, we want the healthiest, the highest yielding soils cycle large volumes of carbon with a continual net gain of con gaining slightly higher carbon levels uh, every growing season. Um, question is, um, can we apply nitrogen fertilizer at seeding while inoculating with biocode gold? And the answer is yes, you can, but it will reduce the effectiveness of the nitrogen fixing bacteria. Uh, I would much prefer, if, if that is a necessity, which I would question, then I would prefer to have it not in close proximity to the seed. At the very minimum, do it at a two by two, do not do it on the seed. And uh, preferably, I would prefer to delay it by six or eight weeks or so. Uh, and again, there's context here that is important. But uh, my reason for that preference is because if we apply soluble nitrogen or soluble phosphorus in the furrow at planting, uh, or even uh, in the two by two and it reaches the seed very quickly, then that will shut down the nitrogen fixing bacteria and the phosphorus solubilizing bacteria and the phosphorus solubilizing fungi, uh, mycorrhizal fungi and so forth. And um, that will effectively um, prevent that plant from forming a symbiotic relationship with those organisms for the rest of the growing season. Um, so fertilizer at seeding is the right material but at the wrong time and perhaps in the wrong place. Um, question from Peter, what low-cost biological monitoring techniques do you recommend for farmers who can't afford qPCR or other soil biology tests to monitor long-term improvements in soil health? Um, you might take a look at the PLFA um, or again, check out biomakers and um, look at the reports that they're able to supply for you. Um, some in the region, a question from Mr. Anonymous once more, some in the regenerative crowd speak about high carbon crops building the soil and legume crops are actually robbing from the soil. How does the carbon nitrogen ratio come into play in your recommendations or does it? And I'm not sure exactly the question that you're asking. Um, first of all, if legume crops, if any crop robs nitrogen from your soil or robs carbon from your soil, then that is a result of dysfunctional soil biology or mismanagement of the ecosystem. Uh, legumes robbing soil seems, um, seems very unfamiliar and oxymoronic to me. Uh, it's We do not observe that happening in, in the soils and crop ecosystems that we manage. So this is a, a new thought for me. And um, so when we look at, uh, we do look at carbon to nitrogen ratios in the soil profile. Uh, they obviously uh, contribute to nitrogen recommendations and nitrogen use efficiency, but only in yeah, I don't want to say in a minor way, but what I do want to say is, uh, think of it this way. It's biology that drives carbon and nitrogen ratios, not the other way around. Um, if you have bacterially dominated soils versus fungal dominated soils, you're going to end up with different carbon and nitrogen ratios. Um, and there's, there's lots of pieces that, uh, that tie into this, but, uh, in general, as a general rule of thumb, if you increase a plant's photosynthesis and you increase soil biology, then the carbon, carbon and nitrogen ratios will largely self-regulate exactly where they need to be in our experience. Uh, comment from Olivier. Uh, hi, Olivier. It's, I'm glad to see you here. It's an honor to have you here. Uh, I believe it would be useful if you could elaborate on how important it is to apply these crops, not only on the commercial crop, but also on the cover crops. Uh, and this, thank you, Olivier. That's a very important comment. When we think of, think of it this way, 
When we work with high value crop growers, they often begin managing their cover crops as intensely as they manage their crops for the very simple reason that um, when they begin foliar feeding their cover crops or using seed treatments or using soil primer on their cover crops, that is by far the fastest way to make gains on regenerating soil health and then growing really great crops. But I mentioned a moment ago that uh, if you apply fertilizers, soluble nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers in close proximity to the microbial inoculants uh, that are being used as seed treatments, then they will shut down their effectiveness and, and uh, greatly reduce their effectiveness and their capacity to form symbiotic relationships with plants and to produce the effects that we're really looking for. Well, if we are, when we are in a transition period, uh, many farmers are uncomfortable and sometimes justifiably so, uh, greatly reducing nitrogen and phosphorus applications. So in that context, it can be very va valuable to treat your cover crop seed with BioCoat Gold or with similar materials. And now you have these microbial populations that can now establish a population in the field and are not being placed in close proximity to fertilizer. So, um, and then in addition, of course, we also know that uh, cover crops have different microbial communities from uh, the commercial crops that we're producing. So microbial inoculants and seed treatments on our cover crop seed are incredibly valuable and very effective at establishing um, successful populations. And we have to remember that the, the ultimate objective of using these materials is to develop soil health and soil microbial populations to the point where we don't need to add them anymore. Sometimes that can happen in a couple of years, sometimes it takes longer, but um, the objective is to build soil populations of mycorrhizal fungi and protozoa and nematodes and these various uh, bacterial populations such that there is no further benefit from adding them anymore. And uh, that's the place where we want to be and it's not difficult to reach that place. Um, there's a, a few questions here I'm trying to question from Braggy. Do any of your products include paramagnetic material? Uh, there's a few that do. It's not something that we really talk about a whole lot. Uh, question from Nathan. My understanding for cover crop diversity is to include uh, different species from different plant families, grasses, brassicas, legumes, and broadleaves, rather than just multiple species of, say, grasses or legumes and establishing a balanced biology. Can I comment on that? And the answer is, um, in general, yes. It's valuable to include different plant families. Um, now, it's interesting. I'll just say that uh, as we learn more about the effects of specific plants and specific cover crops on uh, producing disease suppressive uh, soil microbiomes and so forth, increasingly uh, there are cases where we make recommendations for a specific cover crop to treat a specific problem. So for example, if we have uh, significant challenges with Fusarium or significant challenges with Phytophthora or Verticillium, then uh, we are, as we learn more about cover crops and the symbiotic relationships they have, it's becoming increasingly possible to make recommendations for a specific cover crop to fix a specific soil microbial imbalance. And uh, there's a lot more homework and research that remains to be done here, but uh, we, we already are in a very different place from where we were a decade ago. Um, Question from uh, Mr. Anonymous once more. I wonder if there's only one Mr. Anonymous or a dozen of them. Whoever it is, in any case, the questions have generally been very good, so thank you. How do you help your customers manage yield and profit risk, uh, as in customers following your directions but end up with less than desired results due to nutrient deficiency when reducing inputs from prior management strategy? Um, I don't, in an agricultural context, you never say never, but we, we seldom see this. In fact, I, I, I don't recall seeing this for a very simple reason. We live by the mantra, you, you should never guess what you can measure. And so we do not make recommendations for reducing nutrient applications without having the data to quantify that that is a reasonable recommendation. And, um, so when, when crops observe nutrient deficiencies, 
Um, and also, then we also use plant sap analysis on a 14 day cycle throughout the entire growing season um, to observe whether crops have a nutrient deficiency and what's happening and what's going on there. And um, there have been cases uh, where we wanted to be conservative and make sure that we did not put too much on and we had the conversations with growers in advance to say we're only going to put on this amount at this point, perhaps as a side dress, nitrogen side dress on corn, with the anticipation that if we need more, we will add more later. And then uh, use SAP analysis to evaluate whether we do need more later. And, and here's the key point. This is why this is a viable strategy. is because SAP analysis will pick up nitrogen deficiencies three to four weeks earlier than visual observation, depending on the speed of plant growth and the speed of crop growth. So uh, using SAP analysis gives you plenty of time to correct any imbalances that might show up. So that has been our approach and uh, we've been very successful with that. Uh, question from James Martin. Would you please describe a reliable strategy for measuring carbon cycling in agricultural soils? <laughs> um, that's a fun question that doesn't have an easy answer because, of course, you're measuring a cycle. So how do you measure which fraction of carbon in the soil profile is uh, available to be released in the atmosphere? Um, it is possible. There are meters. I looked at this years ago. It's been some time, but you can obviously you can measure soil respiration. Uh, that would be one strategy. Uh, you can also measure carbon total carbon dioxide delivery from the soil. Uh, in, in actual growing conditions. So those are some of the ways that you can measure it. But um, there's there's going to be some interesting technology released here in the next couple of years that I know about from an R&D perspective that I think we will be able to measure carbon cycling in the soil profile. Um, question from Charles. Uh, what with the world of soil biological amendments becoming the Wild West, who is providing unbiased research to the benefits of these products? Um, to the direct answer to your question, I'm not sure who is doing that. There are probably independent research organizations that might be looking at some of that, but there are many different products out there. But the reality is, uh, I'm not sure that uh, much research on products in different regions is transferable because microbial populations vary so dramatically in uh, in different soil environments. Um, you know, the reality is you have to try them and test them on your farm and see how they're going to work for you. Uh, and I would uh, suggest that if you want to evaluate microbial products, the question to ask the question to ask inputs providers is not um, what are the what is the yield response or the yield improvement because that is necessarily going to be highly variable but the question to ask is what is the consistency of response and how many fields or what proportion of the fields or crops applied that does not deliver um, a crop response um, and then with microbial products, also expect that number to be higher than with a pesticide. If you were to put on an herbicide and it didn't work 10% of the time, that's obviously a non-starter. But this is very different for microbial products. So you should expect microbial products to not deliver uh, results perhaps 20 or 30% of the time because of the context that they're being put into. As David described, if, you're, if you have uh, soils that have been extremely compromised and challenged, then there are some soils and some contexts for which it's difficult for microbial inoculants to produce a response. Um, there's a few other, let me see, what other questions are here? Question from Jim, if starter fertilizer is used, then is BioCoat gold of any value? Uh, we stu do still observe it to see a crop response in that context, but significantly less. Uh, question from Gary. Since it is known that plants can be grown without soil, what is the basis of your philosophy? Uh, great question, Gary. We actually have a couple of webinars on our YouTube channel where we talk about this in some detail. Um, the There are two mainstream models of plant nutrition. One of them, as you refer to the hydroponic model is the model that um, 
plants can absorb single or simple ions from the soil solution, nitrate, potassium, calcium, magnesium ions, and so forth. Uh, the second model of plant nutrition, which has also been around uh, and has been studied at usually, uh, has been studied by often obscure researchers for over a century, is the idea that plants can absorb entire bacterial cells and uh, or fractions of bacterial cells and use those as a nutrition source. Um, I speak about this in some detail on the blog and in our webinars. Look up the work of Dr. James White from Rutgers University. Um, it's possible for plants to absorb 100% of their nutrition from biology and not from simple ions. And I think we've all seen this work to some degree. Many of us have observed it personally or have observed photos of plants growing out of hard rock. How does a tree that's 50 feet tall and several feet in diameter get nutrition from a bare rock face? There is no soil present. That's the the complete opposite of the hydroponic model, and it is really based on this biological model of plant nutrition. Um, we have follow-up questions here. Uh, vertical tillage impact on soil compaction. My soil is tight at three to four inches. I'm not sure what the question is here, Lloyd. Um, obviously, soil compaction in order for microbial populations to really be effective, then we need to have good respiration. This is one of the benefits of the soil primer is that uh, it does improve soil porosity uh, and it does improve um, soil respiration, which is one of the reasons that allows the microbial populations to really establish itself. A uh, question from Jerry Daniels, is a BRICS meter useful in plant sap analysis? Uh, depends on how you define useful. In my opinion, the answer is no. And uh, I have a very detailed blog post on johnkempf.com where I describe why I believe the answer is no if you want to dig into that. Uh, Biocoat Gold is completely organic. Yes, Rebecca, thanks for that question. Um, another question on soil compaction that we've already answered. I think that pretty much, there's there's a few questions here that are duplicates of uh, those that I've answered, so we're leaving a few of them unanswered. But um, uh, there's one last question. We never consider carbon as a limiting nutrient in soil, similar to NBK. Should we, and if so, how do we measure? Uh, the answer is yes, we should consider carboning as a limiting nutrient. And the obviously we can measure it with, um, with well, let me just say, uh, the best way that I know of measuring it at this moment is to use the Haney analysis where we measure microbially active carbon as compared to total carbon and we measure soil respiration. So that's the best management tool that I know at the moment to consider um, or to measure soil carbon levels as a limiting nutrient. So I want to say thank you to all of you for attending. I hope you find the information valuable and useful. And uh, please call us, call our team, and uh, we're happy to work with you and to dig further into any questions that you might have. Well, thank you so much, John. That was really great. And it looks like David had to uh, jump off the webinar a little bit ago. But thank you to both of you for all of your information and for answering all of our questions. Um, just a quick reminder to everybody, we, we did record this. We are recording this. And we will make a replay available on our website if you'd like to go back and review it. And we'll send you an email. Uh, in a little while later today to let you know that that is available. So um, thank you all for sticking with us. And thank you so much, John. And thanks to David as well for this discussion. And thanks to Advancing Eco Ag for sponsoring the webinar. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. And um, John, have a great day. And everybody out there, hope you have a great day and a great start to the planting season soon. Thank you, Julia. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.